Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. This video follows on from my last two, but if you've not seen them, don't worry, because you can catch up after this. I've linked them below in the description. To give you a very brief synopsis, I presented evidence and theory that the Pyramid of Djoza is built over an ancient First Dynasty well, with the whole temple complex being an ancient waterworks. This idea led me to the Famine Stealer, an ancient Ptolemaic document that may be based on an old Third Dynasty source, and it says that the builder of the Step Pyramid of Djoser, a man named Imhotep, visited Elephantine Island, where he is said to have learned all about minerals and stone for building temples and rebuilding ruins. Elephantine Island was once home to a major temple of Kanum, the creator deity, but the island has a history that spans the entirety of dynastic history, all the way from pre-dynastic times to Roman, and then into the Jewish, Muslim and Christian eras of history. On the island, as well as ancient temples, there is a pyramid, which is completely made of granite, the only pure granite pyramid in Egypt. It is 3rd dynasty at the very latest, but there is reason to think it predates the 3rd dynasty. I claim that this pyramid, and the knowledge of the inhabitants of Elephantine Island, is what inspired pyramid building in Saqqara, Dashur and Giza. And this idea should not be dismissed too lightly, because Elephantine Island has played a central and important role in Egyptian history, with major building, enlarging and rebuilding of temples in pre-dynastic 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 5th, 6th, 11th, 18th and 30th dynasties and beyond. So, as a line of inquiry by me, as an independent researcher, I wanted to look at this place in more detail. Could this be the source of sacred knowledge of the pyramid builders of the 3rd and 4th dynasties? Could the Elephantine Pyramid be the inspiration for not just the Step Pyramid of Djoser, but the others as well? Let's take a closer look. When researching ancient Egypt, there are no end of resources, websites and books on famous sites such as Giza, Saqqara, the Valley of the Kings and so on, whilst Elephantine Island goes somewhat neglected. It is a place that is certainly under the radar, but if there is any accuracy in my dot connecting from my last video, if there is any accuracy in the Famine Stealer, then this is the number one place that we need to learn more about and understand. So in this video, that's exactly what I'll be trying to do. In the first half of this video, I will be looking at a very ancient, important and mysterious site on the island. And in the second part, I'll be taking a closer look at the Elephantine Pyramid and the amazing stone technology, including possible physical evidence of stone melting and ancient concrete. For Elephantine Island to have such a critical role in early dynastic history, it must show evidence of having some kind of importance before the Third Dynasty. For Imhotep to travel down there and learn the skills to build an enormous pyramid that has stood for more than four and a half thousand years. Thankfully, excavations have taken place and the earliest phase of building on the island was on its southern tip. Here a shrine was found that was built into and around a core of naturally rounded granite boulders. A populous town grew in the pre-dynastic and early dynastic era, and not just a small settlement, but one as big as the town on the island of around 1800 AD. For the time, it was huge, and evidence shows it was also heavily fortified, being a strategic location in the south of Egypt. There was also one specific very large residence on the island in Old Kingdom times, which some think was like a mini palace for a governor. Probably the most interesting bit for me is the shrine, discovered in 1972 and located on the north side of the Old Kingdom settlement. And because there are huge natural boulders around it, later phases of development in the Middle and New Kingdoms simply filled in the shrine and paved over it and the boulders to create a flat platform for building. Thankfully, this meant that its contents were preserved, and it gave archaeologists a relatively complete picture of this early site once excavated. This early sanctuary was set between two granite boulders, and with the addition of mud brick walls, the ancient pre-dynastic people created a space somewhat square in shape. There must have been an object of veneration placed here, but it has since been moved or lost, and there are no clues as to what was there. Here is the position of the specific shrine, and we know that at least two mud brick rooms protected it, which was further protected by thicker mud brick walls that created a courtyard or roofed hall. 
This stood from pre-dynastic times, possibly around 3200 BC, and throughout early dynastic history. In fact, it remained throughout the entirety of the Old Kingdom, all the way up to the 11th Dynasty, and the end of the First Intermediate Period. That means it survived for six centuries. Throughout this time, the walls surrounding the shrine did get thicker, and maybe in the 5th or 6th dynasties, a pedestal was also added, which was around 1 meter square, and flanked by wooden poles against each corner. It stood in the center of the hall that contained the niche, as shown here. The pedestal is made of courses of brick, separated by layers of matting for extra strength. Experts think this was a canopied podium to support a portable divine image. Compared to the amazing structures to the north of the country, such as the pyramids of Giza and Saqqara, this shrine or temple looks somewhat primal. Even the hundreds of votive offerings that were found here differ from the somewhat formal theology of the rest of Egypt, that being the traditional imagery that we see decorating tombs and temples. The offerings found here were generally made of faience, but also pottery, ivory, limestone and sandstone, and can be grouped in the following ways. There are human figures, including many of children with their fingers at their mouth, and there is also a seated figure of the first dynasty king named Jur. There are also baboons and apes, also seen with their fingers to their mouths. There are also animals including birds, frogs, crocodiles, lions, pigs, hippos, cats and hedgehogs. There are also these oval faience plaques with the head of a hedgehog at one end. The experts call them hedgehog ships, but it is still unknown as to what they symbolise. There are also other finds, such as natural flint pebbles of curious and bizarre shapes, flint knives, model pots, beads, tiles, and so on. Some of these objects seem to date back to the 6th dynasty, as the names of King Pepi I and II are found on some of them, and the only inscriptions in the shrine also date to the 6th dynasty, marked A and B on this diagram. But we know that the shrine does date to much earlier, as there are a series of stratified layers that span the first six dynasties, all of which brought forth finds including pre-dynastic pottery at the base. Furthermore, the date of deposition of these objects doesn't give us the date of their creation, and many of these could have decorated the interior of the shrine for many hundreds of years. The objects are strange because they don't specifically relate to the cult deities that we know were worshipped on the island, namely Kunum, Anuket, and Satis, also known as Satet. It seems to be totally independent, hidden from the masses in a concealed shrine, but a shrine that had importance for 600 years, and as we shall see, it was also important in the New Kingdom. The later 11th and 12th dynasty temples at this location were built directly over this shrine, and they were the people that first introduced the gods, Kunum, Anaket, and Satet to this location, although these gods do have an Old Kingdom history in other parts of Elephantine. The very ancient pre-dynastic and Old Kingdom shrine, its votive figures, and maybe also its beliefs and knowledge, may have literally been buried. But the ancient shrine wasn't destroyed in the 11th and 12th dynasties, it was carefully filled in. In the 18th dynasty, either Tutmos III or Hatshepsut pulled down the temple that was built over the top, and then respectfully added blocks to create a new floor level to build on. But the 18th dynasty Egyptians certainly wished to maintain a connection with the ancient sacred ground, and ensured a new sanctuary was built directly on top. They even included a stone line shaft from the 18th dynasty temple right down to the original pre-dynastic and Old Kingdom shrine, which led directly into the square sacred room. Looking at the diagram, and this reminds me of the stone line well shaft of the Great Pyramid, as you go down from the Grand Gallery to the most ancient part of the pyramid, the Grotto. The 18th dynasty temple was dedicated to the god of the inundation, Satet or Satis but the shrine below seems to have had a totally different history, exterior to the main religion of ancient Egypt. At this point I should add that votive offerings, similar to those in the shrine on Elephantine Island, have been found across Egypt, and many of them were found in Abydos, but these are always early dynastic. The shrine and the votive figures on Elephantine Island seem to have kept their importance for hundreds and hundreds of years, with even an 18th dynasty temple in the New Kingdom containing a shaft to access the ancient site. What was down there that was so important? 
Why was this ancient site so significant throughout dynastic history that the 18th Dynasty Egyptians needed to ensure a connection to this old pre-dynastic shrine? Why did people still need to access it? Did it conceal something of great importance? Well, this is the view into the ancient shrine today, now locked behind iron gates and nobody is allowed in. This is a still from an incredible video on the channel Enigmas of the Ancient World by Luke Williamson. I've linked this below and I would recommend that you watch it in its entirety. You see the rounded granite boulders, the old pre-dynastic shrine that had a shaft above it in the 18th dynasty and we have the square pedestal located here. What you are looking at right now may be one of the most ancient and most important sites in the history of Egypt and if you can get anything from these images please do comment below. It is clear to me that the granite boulders look like they have been artificially smoothed and this part looks like cut stone. I'm not entirely sure what this is in the square shrine but it is very intriguing. I would love to be able to see into it more clearly but there was next to no light available to Luke. I'm not sure that even Luke comprehended what he was looking at when filming and he describes the site as being inside large storage units. The site has clearly been conserved and shut away by authorities and although we can't go in at least the site won't get damaged by tourism. I did some more digging and found this picture inside the book Anatomy of a Civilization by Barry Kemp. Here we see the room from the still in Luke's video in all its glory, yet the important niche is somewhat hidden from view. The location of this important and most ancient site on the island is what is labelled as the Temple of Satet on Google Maps, not the Temple of Kanum, although it is all part of one giant complex, with the Pyramid of Elephantine at the other end. Nobody knows the age of this pyramid and although I said in my last video that this pyramid had no internal features, I continued to watch the video by Luke Williamson and at about 7 minutes in, Luke does go right up to the granite pyramid. He explains that the site is forbidden and there is a no entry sign for good measure. People are not allowed up to it and nobody knows the reason why, yet thankfully he does take his camera right up to the ruined pyramid. He noticed that in places the granite was very black and also that there is a very small corridor that leads into it, whether created by archaeologists quite recently or in the past by explorers or maybe it was always there. No burials or artefacts were ever discovered but amazingly there are two circular holes in the ground directly below it. The true depth of the two holes under the pyramid are unknown. In fact these pictures from the video are all we know but maybe there were ancient wells, like I suspect with the large pyramids in northern Egypt. To be honest I just don't know. If you look at the sides of the hole it certainly looks like they go through the bedrock and although it pains me to see a plastic bottle inside at least this gives us an idea of their scale. Experts say that the pyramid has worked foundations, meaning that these holes must be original features with the pyramid built over the top. There are also these strange features which look like two or three large pits to the side of the pyramid and they are clearly dug into the bedrock. The rock also looks severely rounded and weathered so again maybe these were linked to water, but I must admit I'm speculating. Continuing to watch the video and Luke explains how much of the beautifully cut and polished granite stonework is early dynastic, which is no surprise as the best stonework in Egypt is the oldest, as seen by the evolution or devolution of pyramid building in ancient Egyptian history. This ancient stonework was often moved and sometimes recut and reincorporated into later structures through the dynasties on Elephantine Island. All of this rubble is from a collapsed granite roof, rubble that includes this famous granite box. There is no writing on it, no engraving or inscription and yet it really is one of the most amazing examples of stonework you'll find anywhere in Egypt. Just look at this fine beading in relief in the granite on the back of the box. Incredible. It also has a pyramidian type top. There are at least three of these structures in the rubble, with one made of granodiorite, another of black granite and also this one made of granite. The marks inside this one are Ptolemaic and according to the guide the structure was marked for reuse by the Ptolemaics. This is the red writing we see and they accidentally broke this beautiful structure with their more primitive techniques in stone splitting. 
This site is speculated to be quite similar in style and form to the Khafre Valley Temple at Giza, and apparently the style of joints on the stonework is a near perfect match, as we can see here. So although the textbooks say that this is a Ptolemaic ruin, it was actually a site that is more likely Old Kingdom, with the stone mark to be reused in the Ptolemaic period. I can't confirm any of this first hand, I've never been to Elephantine Island, so I'm going on the evidence presented by others but it does seem to make sense. Egyptologists and independent researchers all agree that there was a strong focus on Elephantine Island in the Old Kingdom. Here we see an inscription on a rock that clearly shows the name Khufu, and there are more inscriptions and finds from most eras of the Old Kingdom. I just want to point this out as well. As Luke says in his video, the guide touches this stone, but the guide doesn't explain it, he merely points it out. Luke does provide a few photographs, and it looks like blocks of granite embedded in a stone, like rudimentary concrete, or are the blocks melted into the stone? I don't know, but it's certainly curious. Luke also shows blocks of igneous rock that are highly polished and almost glassy to the touch. This specific ruin on the island displays the very best stonework, and whether you believe the conventional timeline of dynastic history or not, this work was surely done by the people who came before or at the same time as the Pyramids of Giza. Remember, it is claimed that Imhotep came to Elephantine Island to learn the secrets of building with stone, and then built the Step Pyramid at Saqqara. The granite stonework at this site, the ancient shrine, and the granite pyramid are three key features of Elephantine Island that may hold the secrets we are looking for. I think that Elephantine Island held the key knowledge of stoneworking, and I think that the knowledge or some kind of object was kept in this shrine. And the reason why Elephantine was so special in ancient Egypt is because it was a very unique location. Its culture was like a unique blend of Nubia and Egypt, as seen in everyday things like storage vessels, which show clear dual heritage styles and characters. Also, at the same time as the ancient shrine was used, the burials on Elephantine Island were also incredibly unique. In one tomb discovered in 2005, and like many other early burials on the island, there was found the head of the deceased placed upon a heap of barley grains. This style of burial was totally unique in pre-dynastic or early dynastic history. Some speculate that this was the early Egyptian and Nubian cultures mixing practices, or it could be that this was simply a unique early culture, independent from both Egypt and Nubia. The key to understanding how the Egyptians built megalithic precise and perfect monuments is, in my opinion, Elephantine Island. And if you don't believe me, I want to finish with this block of granite. Now, I studied geology for four years at university, and I have a very hard time explaining what I'm looking at. Now it could be an unconformity, where one sedimentary rock is laid onto another older rock surface, it could be a vein, where fluid has run through one rock type and crystallised out as another, both are common in the geological record, but looking at the cross section view, as circled here, and this dark colour looks to only cover the top part of the granite, the granite remains underneath. Again, there could be some geologic or metamorphic explanation where it underwent heat and pressure millions of years ago, but because of the examples of impossible stonework close by, whatever happened here, were the melting of some kind, it may well be man-made. But how? Maybe with acid as I once hypothesised. Looking at this view, and there is no dark colour on this granite, but there is over here. And interestingly, Luke explains that this is the location of an ancient granite quarry, so maybe what we are looking at is an example of a technology used to extract granite from the bedrock. A technology that maybe Imhotep learned from the island. Like always, I've got so much more to say for future videos. For a start, there was a great library on ancient Elephantine, and unlike the one at Alexandria, a large number of the texts have been kept and preserved, and amazingly, the vast majority are yet to be translated, remaining in a number of university libraries around the world. There are at least 175 documents written in seven different languages. I'll mention these in a coming video, and the fact that many come from the later Jewish settlement on the island.
These settlers who came to Elephantine Island around 750 BC built a temple identical in size and shape to the Temple of Solomon and even made it from the same type of stone. Furthermore, through his research, Graham Hancock believes the Ark of the Covenant left Jerusalem around 650 BC and it was taken to Elephantine Island and was kept inside this Jewish temple until around 400 BC when the temple was destroyed. From there, the Ark went south to Ethiopia. So, as you can see, the importance of Elephantine Island even transcends the ancient Egyptian culture. And what I presented in these past two videos really is the tip of the iceberg. I have a lot more to present in future videos, and I'm also trying to get a hold of archaeological papers from the 70s and 80s, which actually is not as easy as I'd hoped, but I am trying. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.